Christy Wilson Cairns, you wrote the screenplay for The Good Nurse about uh, the woman who ends up uh, stopping Charles Cullen, who was one of the most prolific serial killers in American history, uh, working as a nurse in hospitals. Uh, how did you first learn about uh, Charles Cullen's story? I, I was quite amazed that I had never heard of Charles Cullen because I'm I'm the kind of weirdo that like Google serial killers at um, 3 a.m. Um, and the first time it ever came to my attention was Charles Graber's book, The Good Nurse, which um, 10 years ago was sent to me. It was an open assignment at the agency I just signed with. And I read the first chapter thinking I was going to pass because I didn't really want to do a serial killer story. Uh, and then I stayed up all night reading the book because it's incredibly written, but also the story was totally unbelievable to me and I, and I wanted to tell it. Uh, and I, I know you had discussions with the uh, with the real nurse, uh, uh, Amy, uh, who, uh, uh, you know, was responsible for for bringing uh, this band down. Um, what were those conversations like and, and, and how did that influence your writing approach? Well, the, the book itself, it takes place over Charles Cullen's whole life. So, it, you know, and it, it spans particularly the 16 years that he was killing in New Jersey and Pennsylvania. And I didn't ever want to tell the story from his point of view. I, I didn't really feel a way into that story at all. Um, and then in the last third of the book, you read, you read about Amy Lochran, who is the nurse that caught him. And as soon as I sort of read about her, I was like a working class, single mom. She has health problems. She's trying to do everything right for the patients and she shouldn't have to stop a serial killer, but it falls at her feet. And so I was really struck by this woman. I, I, I kind of couldn't believe she existed. I couldn't believe that we hadn't built a statue of her. And um, when I actually got to meet her, I was incredibly intimidated. I, I was also, I was 24 at the time. I, it was my first paid job. I was really young when I started out in the research of this. And um, I went up to upstate New York in like February. I stayed in a place that looked a lot like The Shining. I was totally out of my element. And I was so fortunate that she was so gracious and open and giving. And, and actually that collaboration with her spanned the entire decade and even you know she was on set and, and and helped with every aspect of the process so she really gave us access to her story and uh how much research did you do beyond uh reading the book and and talking to amy lochran uh oh I, frankly uh maybe a crazy amount I, I i love my research uh and i think i went really well, quite full on with this uh and i was very fortunate so i i had full access to charles graber's archives so I had you know the recordings uh the confession the recordings from the diner scene um the entire court uh recording so I had all of that I, I also I worked two weeks of night shifts at a hospital in Connecticut shadowing nurses I, I thought I would get to sort of stand back with a notebook but they had none of that and so I was changing bedpans I was like you know elbow deep frankly um and then I spent a lot of time with the cops and I spent a lot of time just familiarizing myself with the American healthcare system because it's very different um, from the system that I operate in. And so, yes, uh, like buckets of research, months of it. Um, and, and getting to know the American healthcare system, and I'm sorry you had to be put through that, uh, <laughs> uh, coming from a non-American uh, point of view, uh, like, you know, because the American healthcare system is like the other uh, serial killer in the film, almost. Um, how, what was that like to learn about? And 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 you know, what, did you always want to include that element of it in the story, or did that come as you researched the system and, and found out how, how that? I mean, I, I found the thing that really drew me to this story, apart from Amy, was the fact that it was a movie about. A serial killer where the serial killer wasn't the only villain and also you know usually in these stories you know you get to sleep at night because the serial killer the real villain is behind bars and for me there was an element that the villain another villain in the story still existed and that that was totally entwined with it, it wasn't something I ever tried to to push on it but it came down to the really important question for me I never wanted to have the question be answered in the film, why did Charles Cullen kill people? Because that, quite, that, that answer is unknowable. I would have to invent it. And that felt wrong to me. It felt wrong to Eddie and to Beas and to the whole team. But what was really interesting to me was how did he do it for so long? 
how did this go on for 16 years? How did this happen in nine different hospitals? And to me, that question is only answered by the feelings of the American healthcare system, which puts profits ahead of patients. Um, and as you mentioned, uh, there's no clear answer as to why he, uh, why he committed these murders. Um, does that make it harder to write the character, you know, knowing that there's always this kind of unknowable aspect of him? One of the one of the choices we made really early on in the development process was to tell it from to tell Amy's story and to tell it from her point of view. Uh, and I think there was briefly a time where we even talked about perhaps meeting the real Charles Cullen. But I, I knew that that was never going to kind of yield anything for specifically for the script because it had to be from Amy's point of view. It had to be her understanding of Charlie, and the way she describes him is that he was her friend that he saved her life, that he looked after her. And there was only two times that she saw the murderer. So she she described him in this really didactic nature. And that, I think, allowed me, Eddie, Tobias, and Jessica to really frame how that story should feel and to never let the audience get ahead of, of Amy's character. Because I think that would rob her of, of like her dignity. And also you would be like, oh, of course. So we never wanted to be a whodunit. We never wanted to cat anything salacious or anything like that. So... Yeah, we, we, we always drilled into her version of him because that was the only truth that I had access to. Um, and, you know, the true crime genre in general, you know, can, you know, can be controversial at times, but this film, uh, one of the things I appreciated about it is it, it, it works very hard at, at not being exploitive and that a lot of that comes through telling it through Amy's point of view. Uh, how much were those considerations part of, uh, you know, writing the script? I mean that that was the DNA of the project. I, I think I think there's a responsibility when, especially when you're telling true stories, when you're adapting real people's lives, um, that you don't have the right to invent things, uh, not in that way. And so, for me, keeping it honest, keeping it truthful, I think was the inception of the idea. And when Tobias came on board, I was so fortunate that that we were totally in lockstep with that, and he actually you know we spent a lot of time he was in Copenhagen I, I was in London and um, like Skyping and talking about was there any elements in the script where these rogue kind of horror ideas you know was was the hospital too dark at night did this feel a bit silence of the lambs and just always stripping that out because because I, I love the horror genre and I spent a lot of time with it some of these things slipped through the net so we, we spent a lot of time just let's keeping it real to not make it salacious and also because we had to respect the memory people people died at this man's hand uh, and and in these hospitals and so it was so important to us to not you know uh, in any way tarnish those memories um and amy lockman has been uh you know out and about promoting the film uh you know a bar been a big part of of uh you know the, the press tour for the film uh, what has it been like seeing her get that moment in the spotlight? As you said, she deserves a statue, but and now at least you know she she's uh, getting this kind of uh, moment in in the spotlight. I think I mean the only way I can really I, like I, I can frame it like this. I've spent ten years uh, working on this. Um, I've always come back to it. It's it's been a story that I just really felt it just needed to be told. People needed to know that it happened and to know what this woman had done and you know, 10 years of a process kind of wears you down and you think that's a long time to spend on something. And when we were at TIFF, uh, it was the first time we'd seen it with an audience. And at the the end of the screening, Tobias brought Amy on stage and there was just this rapturous standing evasion. And um, Eddie and I were sitting next to each other and we both were just absolutely in tears because it was finally seeing this woman recognised. And I kind of remember thinking to myself, that's not a bad way to spend 10 years. <laughs> uh, well, uh, congratulations on, on the film uh, and, uh, you know, which is, uh, you know, uh, on Netflix now. And uh, it's a pleasure talking with you about it. Thank you.